Did you know that you have taste receptors in your balls? Soch mein pad gaye. Behtareen. Because that's kind of the point. That is the point of this new podcast. We want to make you think. Think about the world, think about your body and think about science. My name is Dr. Tanya. You might know me better as Dr. Cutris and welcome to the Dr. Cutris podcast. You do have taste receptors on your balls, but that doesn't mean you go around dipping them in different sauces. <laughs> and to explain the science of food and whether or not you have taste receptors in your balls, we have a very very special guest today. Today we have with us my personal favorite creator whose work I've been following for many many years and have been a huge fan of today we have with us krish ashok who is better known as masala lab who makes amazing content and has a very wonderful book that talks all about science and food and history and all the fun things associated with it his reels are completely evidence backed and super scientific but easy to understand so you know i love it and today we're going to debunk lots and lots of things you thought were true but are actually not true all about food and the world around it Hi Krish, welcome to the show. Pleasure, absolute pleasure being here. I have never called this a show before. I just realized this is when I said this. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a lot of food and science and well, sex in here as well. Let's start with the biggest question, which is food and science and sex. Yes. What are aphrodisiacs? So, are aphrodisiacs a thing? Sorry. So aphrodisiacs, well, for the most part, they are frauds. <laughs> for the most part, right? I mean. And once you get past that, uh, the general idea is that humanity o- over over history has always found some rare, expensive, endangered thing, and presume that it will somehow improve your sex drive. It will uh, some food, something or the other. Sometimes it's rhino's horns. Sometimes it's asafoetida. Sometimes it's potato. Sometimes. Uh, anything literally for what it's worth potatoes are very hot <laughs> <laughs> i will die on this hill <laughs> they're the best food in the world yeah so potatoes have uh, again came from south america then were introduced to india only in the like 8 1800s and they were introduced to europe only in like the 1600s so they were considered aphrodisiacs uh, for a period of time and then people realized that it's just a potato it's great for making french fries but Nothing and more. everything else and yeah, everything else that's true <laughs> no but it's so funny to me that like pav bhaji is such an indian dish but it's not yeah. and you have a reel on this <laughs> it is it is the most indian and the least indian right <laughs> and and i think the fact that none of the ingredients in the pav bhaji minus the spices and maybe the lime you squeeze at the end mm-hmm. are of indian origin the potato is not the the chilies capsicum tomato cabbage beans every vegetable used in the pav bhaji is of uh, european or south american central american origin i love this <laughs> so but and yet we're able to basically make pav bhaji out of it right and it's that that method that makes it indian right so biryani as well right so the 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 dum cooking um comes from elsewhere the the idea of cooking rice with meat um, again comes from elsewhere the spices themselves bulk of them actually come from southeast asia and yet uh putting it all together in that unique way is very indian and uh, what i also love is my dog is also called samosa and samosas are not indian but They're samosas not. are so quintessentially indian Absolutely. at the same time and that too with potato which again is a foreign <laughs> this is great the original samosas are lamb or uh, beef mince yeah. right? I mean, uh, it came from the ottoman empire and uh, in fact you can see sambusak being found yes. all over the the middle east and uh, turkey and lebanon and so on right so So since we are talking about potatoes <laughs> and potatoes being after DZX yes um i get a lot of questions from people that you know shila ji throat or uh, kira jadi kira jadi actually has some limited evidence that it does help with erectile dysfunction yeah but uh, i find it very interesting that aphrodisiacs are so so like hyped but they're also so closely linked with i mean a bullshit and b yeah <laughs> b like the wildlife trade illegal trading um, exactly. like you mentioned rhino horn yeah. tiger bones yeah. a lot of cultures believe in eating the testicles of other animals yeah. for boosting like sexual power <laughs> like um uh, what what is it bull testicles is just oh yeah 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 testicles of literally any animal that is hunted in uh, every tribal society in the past has been considered typically the alpha male of the society gets to eat that acha matlab it's a privilege also yeah, yeah privilege also <laughs> <laughs> right tatte khana privilege hai kya baat hai it's funny because i think you know uh, 
despite the fact that when you actually eat <laughs> when you actually eat anything it, no matter what it is we break it down to basic sugar amino yeah. acids and other right unless there's like a ultra active medical ingredient that goes through that barrier it's not going to have any effect so it's, i feel like this is the crux of this this whole yeah. podcast you know like unless there's a potent active yeah. ingredient in there nothing is going to do anything no, honestly not going to do anything right it has to it has to get past your digestive system exactly right? I, yeah. and like another thing that i find very interesting is that anything that looks like genitals is considered like <laughs> like for example oysters yes वल्वा जैसे दिखता है तो मस्त सेक्स होएगा इससे देयर देयर वाज दिस थिंग दैट अपेरेंटली कैसेनोवा यूज्ड टू ईट 50 ऑइस्टर्स एवरी मॉर्निंग ऑफ कोर्स फॉर ब्रेकफास्ट यू नो द फनी थिंग इज दैट इफ एट ऑल एनी पार्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड डिड नॉट नीड एफ्रोडिसियक्स इट वुड बी दिस पार्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड right i think we've done pretty well you know <laughs> okay so i have to share this story because this is my favorite story and it's one of the first posts that i did on instagram that like became popular okay so i was like the making of the influencer <laughs> <laughs> this is from back in that day the concept of food having passionate energy in it yes um it was considered that all foods like that made you feel hot like yeah. spices yeah. Uh, garlic all of these would you know stoke your sexual appetite in a way yeah. which is why if you ate really bland food yeah. you wouldn't feel horny <laughs> now the hell fires of horniness were stoked by spicy hot delicious food so eat bland food which means that this doctor called dr kellogg yeah. decides let's make bland food that people can eat every day in the morning <laughs> oh yes of course so then dr kellogg went on to find a found a brand uh, where he made uh, bland um, food made from corn <laughs> yes that we put in milk and eat in the morning because yes. apparently that was going to stop you from masturbating and he was yeah. such a strong like anti sex crusader yeah yeah He had eight children. Never consummated <laughs> Absolutely. his marriage. Yes. <laughs> no, all adopted. Never consummated his marriage, and yeah. he believes that people should put carbolic acid on their clitoris and their foreskin, wow. so they never want to touch themselves. Wow. Which uh, it's yeah. remarkable how many elements of that story are like pseudo science, right? Yeah. First, the fact that blandness somehow has to do with your sex drive and so on, right? Second is the fact that uh, the reason you feel hot when you eat spicy or hot food is because your body you sweat, right? Yeah. Your your capsaicin and chili is actually uh, actually attract. Uh, gets to your nerve endings and fools your brain into thinking that your mouth is on fire and that's why you feel hot right it's not a real sensation and people when you eat a lot of meat or protein uh, because of you know po- protein based you know, thermogenesis you're going to feel a little bit hot you know they call it the meat sweat if you will right uh, it's because you have to <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, so it's called the meat sweats, right? And not I mean, it's in generally more of a western problem because we don't eat anywhere as much uh, yeah. meat per capita as we do. So it's quite interesting that again that people take these phenomena that are explainable by other means but then attributed to things like food has passion, food has energy, food has uh, you know life and all those sorts of things. In general, your food has to be dead when you eat it. I mean, if it was alive, I think you'd have a problem. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> They have this thing, no, where they put um, soy sauce on uh, freshly cut, cut octopus tentacles to get the nerve endings to fire because there's sodium. Yeah. And then they start like flopping around like this, and then they eat it like that because yeah. then they say it's alive. <laughs> <laughs> it's the illusion of. Uh, it's sort of many things, right? So things like that give you sort of this tingling sensation in your mouth and so on. So there are many molecules that oh, will like, do that. Oh, uh, like right? pop rocks. Like even yeah, pop rocks and uh, menthol and many of these other oh. molecules will do that, right? When you eat mint in general, right? You, you oh, get that actually, sensation. Oh, yeah. actually, mint brings me to this wonderful. Completely unrelated to this podcast piece of information. Menthol cigarette पीने से लोग बहुत घबराते हैं कि दे दे से इरेक्शन होने में दिक्कत होएगी। I don't know why because menthol is so Swadeshi. UP is the biggest producer of menthol in the world. Yes. All menthol cigarettes support my. Yes, and Pradesh. might I also might I also point out that it's a state that's been particularly successful at uh, reproduction as well. So <laughs> I would not really you know, ask them to worry about you know, trivial things like menthol. Th- th- this this is slight shade coming at me because my parents run a fertility center. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. but um, since we're talking about like growing things and you know UP being so good at children, uh, <laughs> maybe not children, making children. Yeah, that would be the another thing that we're told a lot as children is that you know you should eat local and you should eat all all natural food only yeah. and you know all unnatural food is bad. Yeah. So uh, what what is natural food? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny the the word natural essentially is it means whatever you want it to mean hmm. so it's usually what it uh, what happens is that the word natural over history has always been used to describe anything that is of outside origin 
Oh, wow. Generally, anything new is not natural. Okay, huh. anything ours traditional is natural. Um, it's we only, are best, right? So we are the best, right? So there, there were times when um, so people have always used the term natural to dis- to describe everything from say uh, two men marrying or uh, two women marrying or uh, you know uh, for that matter interracial marriage in the past and so on. All of these were considered unnatural, right? Um, Likewise, within India as well, with all the different biases and uh, issues that we have here. Likewise, when it comes to food, there was a point of time when potatoes were considered not natural because they, you know, uh, and then eventually they were just, they were delicious um, and they found their way into Calcutta biryani and then, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the rest is history, right? Um, but but in general, what you'll find is that people often mean whatever it is that they are comfortable with. So in the modern day, the natural word is often used to distinguish between processed food and things that are directly coming. I mean, things that come from a plant versus coming from a plant, meaning as a factory, right? So that's the... <laughs> comes, grows on a plant versus comes from a plant, you know? Oh so that's God, the I distinction. That. <laughs> right. But you know, so many like, natural foods that everybody like sabudana for example yeah, makes yeah. me so mad everybody's like vrat yes. me to main bahut aise acha khana khati hu main to sirf sabudana <laughs> khati hu but sabudana yeah. is processed as fuck yes. yeah. <laughs> so sabudana is sabudana is fantastic evidence of how indians are my most favorite uh, people as, as as an indian i have to say that uh, because we always find a way to cheat religion <laughs> better than anybody else in the world i mean everywhere else people are very afraid of religion indians are not okay <laughs> so if the religion says you shall fast you will not eat rice you will not eat wheat you will not eat all these things because you know back then they can only list things that grew were available in uh. india sabudana was not in that list <laughs> so we will eat it the you know then they came and said oh garlic and uh, you know onion will arouse passions so on these vrat, on these religious days you will not eat onion and garlic so what do we eat let's find another uh, spice that has the exact same flavor which is asafoetida <laughs> you add a ton of hing it tastes like onion and garlic and hing is really popular in families like my mom for example will not like like if yeah. there's onion in the food she'll be like nah, chana, chana, nah, 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 nah. and then she'll go and put so much hing in it <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so i often i've i've showed i've showed my mom the 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 chemical structure of the flavor molecule in asafoetida and onion and say look <laughs> look how similar they're both the same thing right uh, but yeah so indians have a way of essentially doing what they want to do when it comes to food we don't let all these religion and all these other things get in the way we'll find some way around it while still respecting religion we'll find some way around it sabudana is a classic example it's fasting food because it's like ultra processed starch that was invented in the 1940s <laughs> in salem tamil nadu and the funny story is that it isn't even what people think it is Here's the story. So if you look at, if you buy Sabudana, you will find many brands will call it Sago. Yes. It is not Sago. Sago is actually an African palm tree from where this used to be made from. It is not anymore. It is nowadays made from tapioca. The reason for it is that this West African palm, Sago palm from where this used to be made, during World War I, the British mostly used up all of that stuff for... uh, their soldiers and all of that. And so India used to import that um, and it became a shortage. So all these Vrat people were like, what will I eat during my Vrat? Uh, and so some smart entrepreneurs in Tamil Nadu decided, I think we can cheat these these uh, North and West Indians uh, by uh, essentially taking starch from tapioca, uh, oh which is very Lord. common in the South. Yeah. And then process it down to balls that look like the same thing. <laughs> so, and now you're literally eating tapioca. Genius. You're calling it Sago and you're eating it for Vrat. Genius. When it's just a carbohydrate bomb. That's all oh it is. Oh my God. Oh my God. This is amazing. <laughs> but generally, you know, like as much as I love Vrat food, we generally told that Vrat is done around the time of seasonal change because, you know, your body is going to detox itself and you're going to only eat healthy, kacha khana. It's going to be so good. And then we <laughs> yeah. go and eat these, you know, carb bombs. <laughs> yes. Everything in the Vrat is either fried or just carbohydrate. Exactly. What is this detox that happening? Yeah. 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 Misinformation terms in food. One is detox. <laughs> the other one is immunity boosting. I hate that word so much. <laughs> Phrase, word, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Right. So in the sense that uh, your your kidney and liver detox. Okay. Nothing you eat is going to detox. You eat lightly. You take a break. Your body will detox itself. Exactly. You can't like suddenly eat a ton of things, fried food and uh, sabudana vada and all of that, and assume that it's going to detox your body. I think that's it's, it's super fallacious. I also love how people go on these juice cleanses to detox because they <laughs> shit themselves to death. Of course, they're going to detox. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so bad. Yeah, yeah. And you know, you you get these. Um, 
what are they called detox they <laughs> <laughs> then detox teas yeah, yeah. you get Man, that yeah. essentially just make you shit no literally i think again people also underestimate the amount of damage eating random plants can do to you yeah. right to your liver particularly yep. right so you know my, my the other f- famous way in which i troll people is essentially is that if i tell them that if i drop you in a forest right and uh, you have to survive a couple of days right uh, how will you survive where will you find food and so on you'd be surprised most indians will say i they will go find fruits i live in nature everything is edible <laughs> no so they'll say they'll find fruits yeah. things that look like fruits in the, by the way this is jungle not like an mm. apple orchard no? this is a jungle okay <laughs> they will find apparently they'll find fruits they'll apparently dig they'll find roots uh, and they'll start a fire and cook and so on and i and i break it to them and say that 99.99% of plants in the wild will kill you right plants are an entirely different kingdom of life that have no interest in feeding you <laughs> and since they can't move they defend themselves with poisons right exactly. tapioca produces cyanide as does an apple seed as does so uh, tomatoes and potatoes produce solanin so every plant produces a poison every spice is a poison that in small doses is fantastically aromatic right nutmeg nutmeg exactly right it make you high right so myristicin in nutmeg is a precursor molecule for ecstasy yep, so yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> right so so it sort of it makes babies hype so that's why mothers give it uh, nutmeg and milk uh, to put babies to sleep <laughs> mothers breaking bad <laughs> if you will right so but yeah so in a sense that i think uh, so people get shocked when i tell them that the safest things that you can eat when you're absolutely in the wild are either insects or small animals because we are animals that's those are the only safe things you can eat and like freshly killed animals are absolutely safe because mm. living animals tend to want to stay alive so they don't have like t- pathogenic <laughs> bacteria right whereas plants will absolutely kill you so people going on these random herbal you know unless unless one it's been verified by years and years of tradition uh, uh, traditional medicine where you know that this is safe to drink that's fine right it's just natural wisdom otherwise random stuff that you just discovered off the internet and uh, that could like completely mess up your liver around covid time we used to get so many patients with bad gastritis because wow. they were drinking so much kadha ki <laughs> kadha pee pee ke hum immunity boost karenge now yeah. unfortunately a lot of the misery that came from covid was from immunity boosting when yeah. you one of the things that was happening was that the immune system would start attacking itself which yeah. we call a cytokine storm yeah. um when we're trying to treat covid and that's how the lungs would get damaged for a lot of people yeah there was all boosted immunity we don't want to boost immunity when your immunity is boosted it leads to autoimmune disorders yeah. you don't want that yeah. and then people giving themselves gastritis people giving themselves liver issues yes just by drinking kadha and even if you were to go by ayurvedic principles Correct. there's a time to drink kadha there's a yes. season to drink particular herbs yes. Yes. in your kadha but people are just like mm, and no immunity boost right? i mean yeah. it's never and it's not like you just eat that or drink that right? i mean it's part of a, a otherwise balanced meal and and you take a little bit of that right i mean it's um, so this entire people somehow have this feeling that i don't think they understand how immunity works right and yeah. it's it's a part of the education thing right the only way to actually boost immunity is to either suffer from a disease or to get vaccinated <laughs> for the most part <laughs> yeah fair. of course there are like immune suppressant and immune boosting drugs that you can give during cancer treatment and all that but that apart for the average person eating one particular thing is not going to boost your immunity it's just i that's just not how it works if you have an overall balanced diet your body will do its thing and it will do it to the best of its genetic ability right? i mean unfortunately well you know we are products of our genes as well so yeah so but the problem is that people have a tough time saying well it's just down to genetics right so that's why we believe in things like astrology <laughs> <laughs> please i'm a libra <laughs> don't do this to me <laughs> no, but another thing aside from um, yes. this immune boosting food another word that just gets on my nerves is organic <laughs> I want yeah. to sometimes punch people because they don't understand what organic mean. What does organic mean? So the problem is that there are multiple definitions of the word. Thank right? you. Okay. <laughs> so um, philosophically, we'd like to think that it is plants uh, grown without the use of pesticides, uh, synthetic and chemical pesticides, and so on, in in traditional ways, and so on. uh that's the historic sort of uh, definition is that what we think it is right the second definition is what i call the lawyer's definition which is essentially <laughs> lawyers advising companies 
that this is the absolute bare minimum that you have to do to be able to call your product organic right this is the bare minimum because at the end of the day companies need to make money yeah. right um, so you can say uh, you will not use synthetic pesticides but it is okay to use the exact same molecule made from neem leaves and other things end of the day molecules are molecules whether yeah. they came from neem leaf or whether they came from a factory they still have the same effect and if you consume it you still have the same problem right so <laughs> it is just that historically it has sort of become distorted the second problem is that the profit motive obviously is huge right so people are willing to pay a premium for yeah. it so companies will do the absolute least to be able to call it organic and charge you as much for it and you somehow believe uh, that it is better for you mm mm-hmm. multiple studies have shown that there is no nutritional or health benefit of eating organic produce you can feel good about saving the planet i think that's fine if you can afford it yeah by all means we'll do it and so on but uh, somehow fooling yourself that you're eating healthier is i think silly that said we've also seen in some cases if it's genuinely grown in uh, in an organic fashion and so on the plant the has real meaning of right, the real meaning no pesticides etc very low yield like the stuff that you grow in your home garden like mm. for example right um, the tomato in your home garden will taste really good yeah. uh, because it has to defend against pests whereas the tomato grown on a farm has lot of security guards standing around right in the form of pesticides <laughs> like nobody is allowed to come anywhere close so the plant doesn't have to do any work to defend <laughs> so all all that stuff that it produces to defend itself that's flavor mm. those are all the flavonoids the polyphenols all the things that make a tomato tasty right not necessarily healthy but tasty for sure right uh, so the problem is that your home grown tomato has to fight all of that so obviously many of them are going to rot on the plant itself but the ones that you get are going to be absolutely delicious yeah. but we can't feed the planet on that kind of agriculture absolutely and that's such an important thing that yeah. the people who fight for these things are often so elitist and they don't yeah. realize that you know what are the ground realities of food production and exactly science. i think it is more important ethically to feed people yeah than to feed people ethically yeah. i think i know it's a very confusing thing in the sense that you have to first worry about feeding people then you can worry about making sure that the food is produced ethically that is without cruelty without all of that all of that is actually secondary i know people get angry privileged people get angry when i tell them that your vegan lifestyle um is expensive and not affordable for most people yeah. um and it's fine it's great you're doing it and you, it's a choice you're making it's fantastic you know i have full respect for you but you dunking on people who cannot afford to do that i think it's just ridiculous absolutely and it's it's the, the behavior is so like holier than thou that i'm exactly. better than you because i make this choice <laughs> that i am able to make because i have lots of lots of money exactly yeah <laughs> another thing that i mean in the same community that comes out a lot is chemical free <laughs> that what makes me crack up so much because yeah. so there's a cousin of mine that i got into a fight with i will not name you didi yes <laughs> <laughs> but she said something about how um she sent like on our family whatsapp group she sent this post about how you should only eat foods whose labels you understand so if there's any I words see. on it you can you can't pronounce no you shouldn't eat it <laughs> so i was like very nice you make a very solid pi- point how do you feel about dihydrogen monoxide yes she's like that's a chemical i don't <laughs> deal with it and i was like yes the hydrogen monoxide is h2 o yeah. water yeah, or sodium chloride or any of these yeah. other things so sodium citrate or it comes from, yeah citric acid comes from lime juice here yeah? i mean if you say lime juice you understand but citric acid, acid you don't yeah. yeah acetic acid and so on you know the uh, the funny thing is that i often tell people uh, that there is a way to eat chemical free it's called fasting <laughs> right because all food is chemical yeah, yeah. So everything is a chemical yeah. right glucose it's starch it's there are molecules whether they come from a plant or <laughs> grow or a plant or from an animal they're all the same for your body as far as you're concerned right um, so it doesn't really matter people tend to again use chemical like they use natural mm. so they will say this is chemical but this is not chemical right, right? Uh, jaggery is not chemical sugar is chemical <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right they both come from sugar cane um they both, both go very through processed. yeah very processed <laughs> if anything the jaggery is quite terribly un in a process in a very unregulated manner when I mean, you have no idea what all happens when they make jaggery um uh, in fact the way to whiten jaggery is they add sugar <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise people don't like buying that dark brown thing that sort of looks like cow dung right so it's very sticky so first they need to add a chemical to a hydrous uh, sort of powder to make it dehydrated so that it's like not sticky hmm. right shelf life is better uh, then they have to add 
they have to add some ph regulating agents to re, uh, to reduce the to increase the ph otherwise mm. your jaggery will literally curdle milk oh shit so otherwise wow. jaggery is like pretty acidic right so they have to add, adjust the ph and then on top of that people don't like the dark brown color and so they need it lighter so what do they do they just add sugar <laughs> this is how jaggery is <laughs> again you might know some artisanal you know family uh, that you that you trust uh, to make you like super authentic jaggery and all of that by all means go for it it's like super expensive uh, but the average jaggery you find elsewhere it's about as processed as uh, sugar is <laughs> just people this. are just fooling themselves this is my favorite takeaway from the whole podcast <laughs> <laughs> no but i feel like you must hear so many of these like completely random nonsensical things what we call gyan mat pelo moments essentially Okay so that was a lot of fun information but now let's take a quick break and we'll be back with even more interesting conversations with Krish Ashok right after this break. Um what are your top Instagram oh, nutrition man. myths? Oh man. Oh <laughs> man. So I I get I get close to like 100 DMs every day and it is just mostly people sending me some of the most outrageous videos um you know i have like i've i've literally lost my jaw so many times every time i watch them on a daily basis right you know every time i watch them, it's like where do people come up with this right and then i have to tell them no it's fine so i've actually created a bunch of shortcuts to reply to people saying no this is perfectly yeah. okay no this is false right just two letter codes and you know i auto complete that but yeah so i'll tell you the the most pervasive ones uh one has to do with um the idea of uh, pressure cooking hmm. destroying nutrition in whatever you cook right um it's amazing because in my grandmother's generation they said uh, lpg stuff will destroy nutrition because you have to cook on wood fire stuff then Anything? they're like ah no i think uh, then these men decided since their wives were dying from like uh, lung diseases at the age of 40 <laughs> from all the chulhas and all of those wood fired stuffs So they essentially ended up saying they said okay fine uh, pressure cooker is okay because by the way uh, pressure cooker did the other thing Indians like saving money which is <laughs> using a pressure cooker saves LPG fuel they said yeah pressure cooker is now safe <laughs> now obviously the now these people have become rich now the people have these servants and now they're like oh no no we want to go back to our ancient way of cooking on a open pot because you don't have to do it because somebody is doing it for you and people are like no 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 it destroys nutrition um, again the fact of the matter is that all cooking destroys nutrition yeah that's just the way it is yeah. but if you don't cook food most of it is inedible also right? or it's toxic bad, yeah or toxic right so you do have to a dal is inedible and toxic unless you cook it right so you do have to cook it uh, there is no difference between pressure cooking it and cooking it on an open pan one is just more convenient and saves time right so this is pressure cooker myth is a very pervasive one the second one has to do some outrageous things like uh, you should not uh drink water uh, standing standing up. up my mother who's a gynecologist and yeah. one of the most qualified most scientific people <laughs> i know no. so so i've often found that uh, to be respectful to people right i mean people can be scientists people can be uh engineers and all of that right in many cases they sometimes still believe in some of these things purely out of respect for their grandmothers and mothers and not necessarily out of a anti scientific mindset but this is this has been particularly hilarious because i and then i often sometimes tell people how do you debunk something like this right yeah. so um the way to right so it's basically you can apply you can, so carl sagan has this sort of a, a toolkit for mm. detecting nonsense right a pseudo scientific nonsense and you can ask a series of very simple questions right so the first question is that uh what did hunter gatherers do i mean they didn't have chairs were they not drinking water standing up all the time <laughs> and the fact that human beings exist now must mean that it must be okay to drink second thing is you see animals do they sit down when they drink i mean we're pretty similar to most animals you know biologically and uh, do they do it and the third question is uh, do people in other parts of the world that live 20 years longer life expectancy than indians do they <laughs> also follow this tradition and the basically three ways in which you can say that yeah this is probably not worth uh, paying attention to so this water one is a very pervasive one which keeps coming again and again right the third one is microwave ayyo <laughs> again and again right so i've i've posted multiple videos and i've been on multiple podcasts and i've spoken to so many people um it's still very very hard to convince people that a microwave um, is actually safe right i've literally told people that boss the cell phone you're using uses microwave to communicate with the cell phone tower <laughs> 
right? <laughs> and seeing as we are not actually being generally fried uh, and nuked by our cell phones, although some people do believe uh, uh, it does, and uh, to my to which my response is basically that no, it's not the cell phone; it's actually use of social media that's frying your brain. That is true. Right? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this people don't realize that all a microwave does is heat water. That's all it can do. It doesn't do anything else. It's not like any other form of energy at all. It's a very low energy radiation that is literally like radio, but all it does is heat water. And yeah. most food is mostly water. Yeah. Right? At least 60, 70% is water. So it heats water. And because it only heats water, it is the most gentle form of cooking. Right? So people often have, uh, which brings me to the fourth most common misconception that you sh must not eat food kept in the fridge and freezer because, you know, it loses nutrition. This almost feels like anti-technology in some way. Like it's anti-women. Anti-women, exactly. Yeah. The so anything that makes women's lives a little bit more... Anyway, I yeah, go yeah. off on a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not a tangent. It's very much, right? A lot of these pseudoscience is sort of grounded in this idea that if it makes women's lives easier, yeah. uh, it must be bad. Right? For example, one thing that I find very... Uh, I mean, it's not related. Nobody's op opposing the idea of this, but... The invention of the washing machine is very closely tied to women's yes. liberation because yeah. it was such a task to wash clothes and it would take a whole day. Yeah, especially women, Europe, yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah, and women didn't have the time or the energy to do anything other than, yeah. you know, fucking wash clothes. <laughs> yes, exactly, yeah. <laughs> this and, is, and fridge, right? And, yeah. and the fridge, essentially, they didn't have to cook food every time. Right? Yep. So they would just make it in one shot, put it in the fridge. And people don't realize that at a temperature of three Celsius, bacterial activity is very, very low. Yeah. Um, so food lasts four to eight days yeah. in the fridge. Um, and which means that you can, interestingly, for young people, if they don't want to cook daily, a great way to eat healthy is to embrace the fridge. Milk make tip. large portions and store it in the fridge yeah. and eat that instead of ordering out. I feel like this also brings me to the question of fresh versus frozen because so many people are just like, oh, frozen food is bad, <laughs> bad food, very bad. No, 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 frozen. We don't do frozen food. Right. <laughs> well, you know, the, the entire... Uh, we wouldn't have, the entirety of the modern world would not have existed without the invention of the freezer, right? Without without seafood being able to uh, go everywhere. Yeah. Right? Um, a whole lot of, uh, we wouldn't have had this much of a population at all. And most foods have to be frozen when they have yeah. to be transported, right? Yeah. Otherwise you can- And they're also yeah. frozen at their most fresh state. Correct. And, and see, remember that we're all, we're an urban species, meaning that when you're living in a large city like a Mumbai or Delhi or whatever, it's not like you're growing your crops right outside <laughs> your house. Okay, So you, there's no idea of eating local in a city. Mm. Food has to come from far away. And in a place like India, the last you checked, it's a pretty hot place and things spoil. Right. And you do need freezers. You do need refrigeration. Um, and in many cases, uh, carrots and peas have to be harvested suboptimally ripe mm. so that they survive the trip to a city like Chennai, which is very far away from where peas and carrots tend to be grown. Right. Which yeah. are cold climate things. And therefore, frozen peas in a, a place like Chennai is actually fresher than fresh peas. Because frozen peas is harvested peak nutrition and frozen. Yeah. Once things are frozen, they'll survive. Doesn't matter, right? I mean, yeah. it's freezing in time as well, right? Actual fresh peas sitting, rotting around in the, uh, you know, in the truck and in the warehouse and in your supermarket before you buy it. Yeah. Right? So people have this sort of distorted notion of uh, fresh as well. Yeah. So how does one choose how to buy? I mean, obviously, if, you know, fresh versus frozen is, uh, is such a debate. Local is such a debate. How does one choose how to buy your vegetables best? I think, see, as I said, I think this is a, a generally a complex problem. Now, I would often first tell people that you first focus on designing a healthy sort of uh, diet for yourself across the week, right? What are all the things that you probably want to eat in terms of protein, in terms of that? You first figure that out, okay? The second thing you have to figure out is that for that diet, you then figure out your affordability. Because not everyone is like ultra rich, privileged yeah. and can buy avocados, you know, from California and, and all of that or almonds from California and all of that. Um, so you then decide what you can afford. The only thing I want to tell people is that you can eat healthy no matter what the affordability. Yes. The problem is rich people want to tell you that their choices are healthier than the poor people's. That is not true. Yes. And, I, and even, I'll even say this for things that might seem sort of controversial. Like people think palm oil is unhealthy. No, it's a, it's just a cheap, low cost, high quality source of fat. Because it is cheap, because it tends to be consumed by poor people, and also because it finds its way, its way into every processed snack, you end up consuming a lot of it. That's a separate issue, right? Yeah. So in general, 
it's like the broccoli versus cauliflower thing right <laughs> people believe broccoli is healthier like broccoli is expensive not always available but a gobi is always available nutritionally you'll get roughly the same thing right if you're eating true, enough yeah. gobi right that's what you should kale is better than cabbage no boss <laughs> If you're eating cabbage, you're you're doing well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're doing no worse than somebody eating kale and broccoli. Yeah. You can eat uh, cauliflower and cabbage, and you're perfectly fine. Right. So this is the second thing that affordability is very important. After you sort through all of that, then you can say, yeah, now can I make? Let me try and buy local. Let me try and buy seasonal. Uh, let me try and buy ethical. Mm. Those should be third considerations. Yeah. First is what you need to eat. whether you get eating enough second is whether you can afford and what kind of choices you can afford and then after that if there's any capacity left over think about ethics think about morality think about local think about planet and all those sorts of things because i think you know uh, any other kind of posturing by anyone is just just ridiculous it's it's what you signaling in so many ways i i get so many um, young women with pcos who are just like no but my nutritionist has told me you must eat dairy free only and you know you can't eat gluten otherwise it's going to make your pcos worse <laughs> you have to eat healthy in this particular diet otherwise it's your pcos going to get worse and that's what i try to tell them that no matter what you're eating as long as it's healthy yeah it's healthy you don't have to do some fancy diet yeah. and th- this this villainization of dairy i feel like is just it's so funny yeah. but uh, you mentioned feeding people is the primary concern yeah, yeah. and i feel like the veganism the the animal cruelty angle it it, it gets so intense in the way that yeah. it fuels these uh, yeah. debates and the kind of nutrition advice people get if you wanted to give high quality protein to underprivileged kids in a government school in rural india right what would you do um Dal. vegan soy nuggets or <laughs> eggs right i mean it's just i think you know people have to be common sense about it right yeah. um actually even dal versus eggs it's quite interesting dal is If so much a, carbs no not just carbs it's also more expensive per gram of protein dal so uh, a kilogram of tur dal is like 120 100 115 bucks right um a kilogram of that probably contains about 150 grams of protein okay now also not first class protein and not only that yeah not not great but that's fine that, that you're fine uh, plant protein will say is about as good as animal protein let's not even worry okay. about that for now right um the interesting thing is that a, if you look at poor people in rural india a whole bunch of them the reason why a whole bunch of them even the poorest farmers will always have some chickens and mm. goats running around is because that's basically protein for free yeah right uh, uh, if you have a bunch of uh, hens running around i mean you're going to get eggs you're yeah. going to get the eggs daily right um and then they feed on agricultural base see people forget that the reason we did animal husbandry back in the day yeah. is to create a circular economy of things that consume the waste from agricultural uh, production and then turn them into protein yeah. right of course you can say yeah it's cruel when it's industrialized yes right and the other point is that uh, a lot of the uh, poorer rural kids will absolutely prefer the taste and flavor of egg hmm. um, and meat over dal yeah right because there there are there are caste specific distinctions in flavor in in preferences and all that i don't think it's fair to impose your idea that dal is the best protein for everyone it may be so if you're a vegetarian absolutely fine but if you want eggs it's pretty cheap yeah right i i think the people don't really think about the economics of food at all right uh, a rice plant 95% of the weight of the rice plant is waste we only eat the grain wow not only the grain we remove the husk and only eat the white part wow yeah what and we grew all of that so by the way all the carbon and all the input and all the energy that went into growing all of that plant of which you are consuming this much where do you wow. think all of that uh, where do you think all of that goes right of course when do we realize it when punjab farmers burn that stuff and then it you know clogs up uh, delhi's uh, yeah. uh, smoke right and causes smog and so on that's when we kind of realize it right yeah. but historically the way the reason 10000 tens of thousands of years ago people essentially realized that i'm producing so much waste mm-hmm. if i could domesticate a herbivore yeah. that can happily turn this absolutely non nutritious waste yeah. which by the way we can't eat we can't yeah. digest cellulose and these animals can turn that into, into high quality protein then you get dairy you get eggs and right? manure and manure <laughs> and then the manure then fertilizes that's what a circular uh, system looks like we're not doubting that the modern day industrial system is unsustainable yeah. there are problems with that but we're also 8 billion people mm-hmm. right if you think this sort of idyllic notion of agriculture can feed everyone and that we can all eat the same you know uh, vegan protein and so on that's fine i wish we can that would be a great fantastic world but it's not there yet yeah, yeah. i want to answer the modern problems require 
modern solutions meme here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But you know the problems are so unique, yes. and I feel like in in this sort of hyper. Uh, There's just so much information out there. Yeah. There's you you being bombarded with just all kinds of wrong and right information yeah. at the at the same time. How does one find the right sources? How how does one? <laughs> If anything, all of these new chatbots are going to make it worse mm -hmm. because then you you know then now you don't know uh, what information people are even getting. Right, because some of these new AI bots are hallucinating and making up stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right. One of the things I kind of speak about in Masala Lab as well is that. What is Masala Lab? Masala Lab is the name of a book. It's the science of Indian cooking. It's actually quite fascinating that it really started out as a way to cook more delicious food and for people to learn how to cook more efficiently. Right? Never really focused on health and nutrition at all. Other than debunking some very common egregious things that prevent people from enjoying delicious food, right? <laughs> But it, you know, obviously, the Instagram avatar ended up having to <laughs> debunk a whole lot of uh, health and nutrition stuff. But yeah, so the book largely focuses on the science of Indian cooking, right? Uh, and understanding basically what goes into making your food, uh, the simple physics, chemistry, and biology. Not very high end stuff. You don't have to be a, a nutritionist or a doctor or an engineer. Just have to be a high school. Uh, even if you. hated science in school one of the things i do is that i use masala lab to teach class 6 7 and 8 kids uh, biology chemistry and physics oh nice in the kitchen so we basically make a dish um and in that process they understand convection how heat gets transferred why materials matter uh, how biology of plants is different from biology of animals so why do plants become soft when you cook meat becomes hard when you cook uh, meat stays juicy when you add salt plants lose water when you add uh, salt they get dehydrated uh, and then what happens when the temperature is higher than 110 celsius browning happens so all the common sense stuff that you can see You can understand science far better in your mm. kitchen than you can in a physics, chemistry those really terrible physics, chemistry labs in school, right? The sterile environments where you don't learn anything, right? Nothing practical. And I might also add, please, the book is really funny. It's the first book that went into my <laughs> kitchen. I just put it there. It's, it's like it sat right next to my stove. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in that, one of the things I kind of talk about is this idea of living in a world where there is too much information mm. about food. Etc. Etc. Why should someone trust uh, Krish Ashok over uh, anyone else? Right. So at the end of the day, I'm also a random person influencer on social media, I'm saying something. Right. Um, so which is why I really think the the sort of rational pseudoscience detection mindset is what becomes important. Where you do not trust individuals, you trust the process. Mm. Right. You trust the idea that if somebody is saying this will produce toxin, so. <laughs> Just asking them the question. Name the toxin. <laughs> right? Toxins have names, na? They have feelings, right? They have aspirations, right? They have, you know, they also want to write neat and you know, enjoy the engineering, medic. So basically, you know, so you have to you have to ask some basic questions, right? What toxins? And you'll find that when people say they don't know. Then you know that well. I don't think the person knows what they're talking about. No, right? you know what? If if I say that to my like not my parents because they're fairly. Chill. <laughs> But uh, if I say that to some, you know, buzurgin back home, ki uh, toxin kya hai, then they'll be like, "Bado se ladogi." Ham batate hai toxin kya hota hai. Tumhe sab aata hai. Bahar padh liyo to sab aata hai tumhe. Angrezi school well, ki padhi hui. <laughs> well, of course, right. But yeah, I'm, I, at least I think there's something. At least the younger, younger generation has no problems asking questions. Yeah, yeah I, I love that. <laughs> yeah, so I think they should be just ask some basic questions. What, what toxin, right? Um, uh, the second thing you need to find out is that don't just trust one source of information, right? The reason why scientific, scientific studies require multiple people to verify it um and you have to do multiple studies before you have any confidence and the other thing remember that there are there is no 100% confidence in anything mm -hmm. when it comes to food and nutrition right yeah. it's all probabilistic yeah. meaning that for example with reasonable surety most scientists agree that cooking in a nonstick pan will not kill you okay. <laughs> da 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 dum <laughs> right so Of course, there are all kinds of edge cases. If you mm. burn your nonstick pan to like for three hundred Celsius and all of that, it will produce fumes, which incidentally might make you sick briefly. Again, there is no evidence that it is carcinogenic or anything. But yeah, of course, it's bad for you, right? But if you're burning food to three hundred Celsius, I you think Teflon is the least of your problems, <laughs> and you have other problems, right? So. In any case, uh, I think it is just that people need to not trust single sources of information, yeah. right? Uh, people need to ask for data and evidence. Uh, people need to ask first principle questions. I think ask it's okay to ask dumb questions. Yeah. 
ask people to explain it to you and if they can't explain it in simple terms then i don't think they understand it absolutely right? yeah. this 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 trick has been so useful for me generally yeah. for like learning things when i was in medical school and i there were complication there were concepts that were very complicated yeah. i would just be like how will i explain this to myself when i was 5 yes and that helped me understand the subject so yeah. much and like obviously it changes um, it changes the way you see the subject yeah. but uh, it's the the reducing things to their very essentials Absolutely. and be skeptical on the internet my god people believe everything yes the the concept of skepticism is completely lost <laughs> yeah yeah and and also be aware of uh, your own biases like mm. for example uh, one is that don't assume anyone is neutral everyone is biased yeah right learn to recognize those biases and then adjust for it and a very common individual bias is what i call the negativity bias which is very important to understand on the internet if you see a piece of information that says uh yeah microwaves are perfectly fine for reheating samosas okay versus microwave causes cancer <laughs> uh and leukemia and a bunch of these other things um you are going to pay attention to the second yeah. one you're actually going to glibly ignore the first one right so it's sort of like the whole man man bites dog dog bites man thing right meaning that today there was no murder in delhi is not news right there was this brutal murder in delhi is news yeah the reality is that the fact that there are murders is a very rare event yeah right the problem is that your is social media essentially is a way of navigating the world only through trivialities and rare events and you have no sense of actual context yep. you have no sense of for example people coolly throw around the world carcinogenic mm -hmm. right people on instagram are diagnosing cancer more than oncologists are right i i have spoke to an oncologist who said did you know by the way this is uh, supposed to cause uh, this was supposed to cause air fryer is supposed to cause cancer is like oh Even i didn't know <laughs> i've been researching cancer for 20 years i have <laughs> never come across this. this so people have to re recognize that research is hard and it takes a lot of effort um, and you can't just make these random guesses about things without backing it up with evidence and so on right so that i think is a people have to be really really skeptical about everything they see yeah. by, by default so there is also sometimes you will notice a tendency to try and take traditional wisdom if you're only explaining this traditional wisdom i think it's fine hmm. right it's clearly it's past the test of time and we know they're not uh, unsafe because you know people have been doing it for years how we cook and what we eat and so on but always be suspicious when people try and use scientific plug scientific terms into these traditional things yeah. they'll suddenly use the terms like hormone boss we didn't know about hormones till the 20th century who are you kidding we couldn't diagnose scientific hom like the minute quantities of hormones like 30 years ago like we can now bolte pcos bahut bad gaya diagnose nahi kar pate the pehle isliye exactly. bad gaya abhi yeah <laughs> there's so many biases the framing bias in the sense that if you there is more detection of cancer now Exactly. And not only that, we're living longer. So yeah. that's why we're getting more diabetes and cancer Absolutely. and you're detecting more of it. People died from infectious diseases uh, much earlier, In their right? young age. And the other thing they remember, the other thing people forget that's slightly harder bias to uh, uh, really detect is the fact that in the past those who died from infectious diseases, or those who survived infectious diseases and all the other problems of the past they survived wars they survived infectious diseases multiple levels of them there is a selection bias they're already pretty healthy by the yeah. way so when when people say my grandfather never had diabetes boss he was already selected from a large number of people who died earlier yeah he was already pretty healthy right survival of the fit exactly but now today vaccines and medicines essentially allow anyone even with mediocre health capacity to survive into their 80s yep. and that's a good thing yeah. right so that's the reason right so the problem is that your grandfather was healthy because millions of people not like your grandfather died yep and you don't know about them you don't talk about them and you just think your grandfather lived in a utopian world no he was a badass survivor right but now you don't have to do that you can get your kids vaccinated right and i think you know it's a very hard mathematical bias mm -hmm. for people to wrap their heads around right it's in also general it's a harsh concept in general yeah, to accept very hard yeah very hard right very hard to accept that the past was utterly shitty and terrible <laughs> nothing about the past was actually it's a wonderful uh, sort of yeah not it's not a book but it's like a prop that says <laughs> um, my 18 children are dead and i have the plague 
a, a romance novel written by somebody born in the 1800s <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly right imagine having like eight children because you are essentially accounting for the fact that two or three of them will die from smallpox yeah. uh. i mean how or in childbirth or yeah, exactly or in pregnancy. childbirth right yeah Just, uh. yeah terrible yeah I think people forget all of that, right? So it's only rosy view, Let's rosy view of the past. The past. <laughs> Let's romanticize the past. <laughs> Let's romanticize the amazing food and all the vitamin deficiencies <laughs> and scurvy and uh, pellagra and all the rest of that stuff. And all the like, you know, these days products that are available in the market are tested so extensively. Yeah. पहले तो कुछ भी बेच देते थे कोई नहीं देखता था. Yeah. अभी everything goes through rigorous testing yeah. there's standards for everything yes. but nahi 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 abhi rehna bahut bura time you know we yes. live in a terrible time correct <laughs> and all oh corporate villains who are out to poison you and so on boss they have a business to run they have no interest in killing <laughs> yeah. you right i mean actually if you die you it would be net business loss to them right so there is a, a case to be made that they have a vested interest in keeping you alive <laughs> healthy or not is an entirely different thing but i understand that again ultra processed food is yeah, causing totally. lifestyle diseases and again it's a different issue right to be honest my one of my other pet peeves is uh, is the number of people who believe that refined oil is some sort of wicked even diabolical villain right refined to be problem refined oil yeah, yeah refined is a problem refined because chemicals are you bhagwan okay, right <laughs> so although refining literally involves the removal of chemicals from <laughs> oil things that are not fat but no that that that's not the point but refined oil is poisonous okay it's bad for you etc etc cold pressed the way we used to do it ancient ancient ways and so on. cold pressed oils burn at low temperature why because when you squeeze a plant seed you're not going to get fats you're going to get many things that are not fats and those things burn at lower temperatures so if you try and heat a cold press oil it will start smoking at a very low temperature and if you're doing tadka or deep frying that's bad that's where the carcinogens are coming in exactly <laughs> that's where your all those carcinogens are coming in on the other hand refined oil all the stuff that's not fat has been removed right yes you can still go after companies for using hexane and making sure that there is no hexane left in the oil and by the way the fssai does this test they have found no hexane residues in any major brand of refined oil now you can say no 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 i don't trust the fssai they are taking money from the i mean at some point you can build your <laughs> conspiracy theory but then you know there's this concept called occam's razor which is yeah. that at one point your elaborate theory is too complicated to be true <laughs> so the simpler explanation that it's probably safe is likely true right so the whole idea of refined oil is is a classic example in india people don't realize that you're legally required all companies are legally required to fortify all refined oils with all fat soluble vitamins oh wow yeah. right so that you know just like how salt is iodized so mm-hmm. you don't ever run out of a iodine problem why you did india have to iodize salt because many vegetarians don't eat meat don't eat fish not getting enough iodine from plant sources so yeah so iodize mm. the salt fantastic idea right likewise uh, many indians are vitamin deficient particularly it fat soluble it. vitamins mm. vitamin e vitamin d uh, k and so on mm-hmm. adek and all of that right so uh, your all the d- daily requirement actually comes from your uh, refined oil and now people are buying cold press oils <laughs> those are not vitamin fortified i am hoping they are paying attention to fact that they're getting all of their vitamins from elsewhere right i mean people don't you know sort of uh, don't realize these kinds of things i i think most of it can be summed up with you know saying that back in the past people were busy being dead yeah you know now we are alive so we yes. have the time to create these bullshit <laughs> concepts <laughs> exactly yes we have too much time on our hands yeah. <laughs> we have too much time on our hands yes but this has been such a wonderful episode thank you so much it's it's been so much fun learning about this and talking about this and i this is probably my favorite episode so far so thank <laughs> you <laughs> thank you honor thank you <laughs> thanks for being here super